Okay. Hiya. Uh, I'm sometimes described as being the real Sarah Robotham, which is totally weird. And um, the lovely Liz, somebody somewhere in the audience said, oh, hi, Sarah. And I kind of thought, oh, she knows me off the telly. She's seen me somewhere. And it's because I've got my name badge written on. <laughs> that was why. Um, I'm a, a glasses on, glasses off kind of person. So I'm quite sure you all look gorgeous with your new nails and your new do's. But once I've taken them off, I can't see you at all. Um, <laughs> Okay, so yeah, she's done half my presentation already by telling you who I am. I thought I'd tell you a little bit about how I, what brought me here today, really. Uh, not the train. Um, my career in uh, sexual health uh, started when I was about 19, and I worked for the British Pregnancy Advisory Service, and I was a, a counsellor, and uh, we supported women who were requesting termination of pregnancy. And then when I qualified as a social worker, I worked in HIV around a time when lots of people were still uh, dying with the condition. And most of those people were my peers, were the same age, and um, I realised I didn't really want to work in palliative care. That wasn't for me. So it was around the time that Tony Bloody Blair had an agenda around teenage pregnancy. And um, thankfully, there was a lot of funny money around, and I was able to convince enough people that one-to-one -one support for vulnerable young people was the best model of practice and that we were able to have a really good impact, um, certainly around prevention, um, and support young people to make different decisions around their sexual health. And we were really good at it. We were really, really good at it. Um, I'm not, um, I'm not um, a PowerPoint type of person. You know, in real life, I'd have a flip chart, but I've got these little bits of paper, so just please bear with me. So, so yeah, so we were dead good, said that, aren't I? Yeah, we were dead good. Um, and I was really lucky to be able to handpick my staff who were youth workers, lived in the community, they worked in the community, they knew the kids, they knew the schools, they knew the streets, they knew the language. And I was really fortunate that I was able to handpick those women and train them, and they worked with me for about 14 years altogether. Um, so I, th I think that kind of makes me a reasonable manager, actually. Uh, none of them disappeared. Um, and we had principles of practice, and one of our principles of practice was that actually sex is not for children. Uh, we kind of thought uh, the age of consent should be about 36, uh, because by that time you are able to make positive decisions about your own sexual health, hopefully. Um, you don't mind being seen naked. Um, you are able to say yes and no to the kind of sex that you, do, that you would choose. Um, so sex isn't really for children. That was one of our basic principles. But actually, we're very incredibly realistic that lots of young people were engaging in sexual activity, but that most of that was risky. Um, and what we wanted to do was to have an impact over young people's decision making, improve their knowledge and their skills and their attitudes towards themselves and their, their sexual well-being, um, and support them to achieve their full potential. That was one of our big aims, which I'm sure I share with the vast majority of you here today. So over about 11 years, we delivered 11 years, we delivered education and provided support to around 5,000 young people. Um, and we had a massive impact over the chlamydia rates, the teenage conception rates. Um, we also had syphilis amongst teenagers, which we got quite giddy about because it was something unusual and we had to create a whole brand new programme. But syphilis amongst teenagers was really unusual around the country. We were giddy, um, but in terms of public health, it was a real serious concern. Um, and by the end of my career in 2014, I was a strategic lead. I, I was a specialist practitioner and I had responsibility for all kinds of targets and was the manager of crisis intervention team. And I had the same women who I'd recruited in 2003. The reason I want to tell you that is so that you will understand, and it's important for me to tell you that I wasn't a maverick. I wasn't a standalone person. I was somebody who worked like you did through going to work every day, doing my education and training, my own personal development, to get to the point where I had significant responsibilities within the NHS. I'll come back to that, but I wanted to tell you that's who I was. 
One of the first referrals that we got as a team was a young person in year 10. Um, and for anybody who doesn't know, that's kind of third year in Funny Money. Um, so she was referred by a teacher and um, the teacher had suggested that she was giving away free blow jobs to year 10 boys in during school hours. And there was some talk of exclusion they, would, they wanted this young person off the premises. It was causing disruption. So I knew that we had a role to play, not only with that young person, but with the young men who were in the queue, um, the teachers and the, the school community. We had a role to play. So it wasn't simply about intervening with that young person, the young woman, it was about making sure everybody shifted their attitude because ultimately the, the, the kind of sentiment behind it was if she was getting payment, some kind of payment for it, that could be, that was a lot more understandable. That was the, at the atmosphere and the environment. People could understand it more if she was given, being given SIGs or money for, for that transaction. So and the, the young men who would find it very difficult to say no in that situation. It would be really hard for a young lad to say, actually, no, I'm not bothered about any of this. Uh, we felt that we had, an, uh, we, we had a potential role with those young people. I referred that young woman over a period of about six years. I referred her seven times to children's social care. And that wasn't simply at times when I thought that she was vulnerable. It was because I believed absolutely, and, and it was our assessment that she was at risk of significant harm. And by that, I absolutely meant that I feared for her life. I thought that she was, there was potential that this young girl wasn't going to survive the next day because of the threats and the fear and the manipulation and the coercion that surrounded her. Every time I referred her, there was an initial assessment that suggested that she was making her own decisions and then I was told that there was no evidence of child sexual exploitation. Using her own decisions, the social services used the legislation which actually supports us in sexual health. So they used Gillick competency guidelines, they threw that at me, they said she was Fraser competent, the same kind of legislation, that she was able to make her own decisions and she was making a lifestyle choice. They said there was no evidence around child sexual exploitation because she didn't present herself as a victim. She wasn't prepared to sit down with the police officer and say, I am being abused. And because she didn't do that, then there was no evidence of child sexual exploitation. The police described her as difficult to engage and made little or no effort to investigate the crimes that she was, dis she was disclosing. Turned over my page, and I shouldn't have turned over my page. I need to learn how to do PowerPoint. <laughs> so yeah, so that was an example. That, that was just one example, and I'll tell you about her in a minute. But that was just one of one of the examples which contributed to my belief that young people were being categorically failed in my town. They were being categorically failed in my town, and the wall that was put up that prevented me from successfully making a difference to that young person and to many others was impenetrable. And there was nothing I felt able to do to break that wall down um, and to make that young, young woman safe. Eventually, um, with a change of staff at the police station, I was able to convince a brand new inspector, a woman inspector, that um, she was at the, at the Public Protection Unit, um, that she should do some disruption. And she agreed that she would go and knock on some doors of some potential perpetrators. She would let the community know that the police were paying attention to them. And the idea was that that would disrupt their activity. And at the time, I was kind of grateful for that because that was the first time any action had been taken by the police. When she asked for overtime, you're getting the inside story now to what actually happens. So when she asked for overtime, thankfully, somebody hi higher up than her said, what do you want this money for, for all these police officers? It'll cost us less if I give you two 
uh, uh, they're called band five or level five investigative police officers who've got the skills to be able to do a serious crime investigation. So instead of paying for all these coppers to work at a weekend, I'll give you two of these coppers and that'll be more cost effective. Now actually that worked out really quite well because they brought these perpetrators into the police station. These level five police officers used their skills and realised that actually we'll, we, we will be able to secure some evidence here that means that we can lead to a conviction. So on the one hand it was about saving money and minimising and de diminishing the crime but then on the other hand that works really quite well because those officers were able to get good enough evidence that meant that they would take an investigation further. The downside was that they made arrests, so they arrested those men quite soon, which meant that they didn't have very much time because the clock started to tick. They didn't have very much time to gather as much evidence and were only able to charge the men with conspiracy to commit crimes rather than charge them with the crimes that they actually did commit. So the sentencing at that point was quite low. So some of the men got six years for conspiracy to commit crimes rather than for the crime. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so they got a minimal sentence. That wouldn't happen now, thankfully. The police have learnt. That's all they tell me. I started to sound really bitter now. I, I am <laughs> bitter. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I did all of that. And then, um, so the court case that you saw on the television, and I'll just tell you about the, the, the BBC drama. Um, because it's the BBC, the BBC is a public broadcasting company. Everything that they did in the drama had to be verified by at least two other people. So I, could, I couldn't just rock up and say, oh, I was dead good when I did that. I mean, I, you know, I was really brilliant when that happened. That, ha that had to be verified by at least two other people. Then it had to go through a whole series of legal processes <laughs> with the BBC solicitors who were able to say, yes, that stands up. Um, as, as a legitimate <coughs> thing that actually happened. It's called a drama, the Three Girls drama was called a drama because it was probably a period of about five years that was squeezed into about three hours. Um, but what you're actually seeing is an accurate portrayal of all our truths, <coughs> so our collective truth. So my perspective I believe to be true, the young people's perspective they believe to be true, the same with the police officers who were represented. So it's actually a drama documentary. Uh, Maxine Peake played me, and I know I'm much better looking than Maxine <laughs> Peake, but I thought she played a good part. <laughs> the, by the time um, the young people in that particular court case, it was called Operation Spam, by the time that those young people who appeared in that court case, um, and, and we're actually, I'm about to do my eighth, court case starts on December the 11th um, with um, crimes that were committed in 2004, 2005. Um, there'll be five perpetrators and one girl. The girl who I started to talk about earlier with the year 10 boys, she'll appear in court next year and so far they've identified nine perpetrators for her um, and arrests will continue. Um, uh, uh, there's another girl that will happen at the end of spring. Um, I believe they've arrested six people for her. Um, the, the crimes committed against her were also in 2004. Um, so out of those court cases that we've attended so far, the average length of uh, time that those men have been given is about 12 years, which gives you an indication of the seriousness of the crimes that uh, took place. By the time those young people have appeared in court, and those, those young women next year will probably be about 27 now, um, some of them have had their children removed. They were all perceived to have failed education. Some of them are still in domestic violence relationships with perpetrators. And loads of them have got criminal convictions for crimes that they either committed on or with or behalf of their perpetrators. So one of the consequences of inaction at the time of me originally reporting the rapes and assaults is that victims are having to revisit and live, relive that traumatic time. 
in the drama, there's a short scene where I am questioning what the value was for the young women to continue to pursue them to go to trial and to give their evidence. And I really did question my motivations. Why am I making them do this? Why am I supporting and encouraging them to talk to the police again? And engage with the judicial process that had totally failed them so many times before. And they've been let down. However, I believe that a paedophile, a child abuser, doesn't actually stop committing their crimes until they're caught. Following the court case, um, so many measures now have been put in place which further protect the victim and the witnesses. Um, and things have definitely changed. Throughout that process, uh, even though we've been through that process, those men can no longer abuse. Across the country, every area now has made significant changes to pre prevent this from ever happening again. But it shouldn't have been like that in the first place. It shouldn't have had to happen in that way. I shouldn't have had to choose to whistle blow, and those children should have been listened to. See, I didn't know I was a whistleblower until I read it in the paper. <laughs> I just thought, like you, I was going through my child protection proceedings, and I was telling everybody that children weren't safe. <coughs> I got to the point where I, I actually phoned Childline, first of all, and they said, you're not a child. Uh, phone the NSPCC. So I phoned the NSPCC and they kind of went, ooh, not sure what we can do about that. Went to my union, they kind of did the same. And eventually I ended up at my MP's door. And thankfully I had an MP who believed me. And that point of being believed was incredible. It took a huge weight off my shoulders and he was able to champion. He had the power to be able to champion the cause and took it to Parliament. After I appeared at the Home Affairs Select Committee in front of Kifaz, uh, my mum had bought me a new shirt and she paid for me to have my eyebrows done, and so I was fine, uh, full of confidence. Um, the, they sent Ofsted in to Rochdale, and, um, and it's what you have to kind of imagine. 25 people were sacked or resigned or disappeared. And they were seriously senior executives, so the independent <coughs> chair of the Children's Safeguarding Board uh, publicly resigned, the director of children's social care publicly resigned, senior police officers did, uh, the people who were sacked were the social workers. So that whole landscape of those people who were in positions of power was suddenly no, long, no longer there. But as a consequence of that, the tsunami that swept over Rochdale took me with it, and my organisation decided that my skills were no longer required. Uh, they called it organisational change, which is actually what they say when they don't want me to wear there anymore. Um, so it was very difficult for me to prove that I'd been um, uh, cons constructive, constructively dismissed. Uh, it just simply meant that the strategic lead of young people's sexual health, the coordinator of crisis inter intervention team, the person who'd reached all their targets around chlamydia and teenage conception rates and syphilis was no longer required. I'd also set up all kinds of great stuff around access to termination of pregnancy as well, so they just didn't want that anymore. Today, most of the young people who were sexually exploited have had successful court cases and have been awarded thousands in compensation <coughs> but sometimes I kind of lie in bed and think that's a bit insulting actually I'm not sure that that money makes one jot a bit of difference to their lives in some circumstances I think it makes it worse to be absolutely <laughs> fair does the men being in prison make it any better? I'm not sure. Don't know. Somebody else feels as though that is an indication of justice, from what I can see. It's other people think that's what justice means. It doesn't necessarily feel like justice for either victims or the witnesses. Where are we all now? So I see some of the young people, because I live around the corner, 
and uh, see him taking the kids to school and I ask him about the children and they ask me about my trainers and nails but we never talk about that time. The team of really skilled and fearless women who I work with, who I handpicked, who we went through so much together are really deeply scarred and don't function very well and aren't working in that field anymore. I know that collectively we have to take some kind of solace in the fact that, well, just like it used to be acceptable to send children up chimneys, nobody will ever be able to say that a young person who is being abused and sexually exploited is making a lifestyle choice. I know how lucky I am to have had my story told. And coming to stuff like this really supports my recovery, my journey. Uh, it makes me feel better to be amongst my peers again, to talk about things that I know about, that you know about. So I am really honoured to be here today. All my team and those young people have been violated and we have suffered injustice. And I'm not sure how a person recovers from an injustice. Equally, there's something very fundamentally different between surviving and thriving. And I don't know what the answer is uh, to make any of those individuals feel better. I thought we're here on a training course, so I'd like you to go away with some questions back into your workplaces. Um, you know, me, that's, that's the training element of this presentation. Um, are you in a union and if not, why not? Does your union support or your organisation celebrate whistleblowers? Would you change that word from whistleblowers to uh, freedom to speak? Whistleblowers are never celebrated. They're never championed. They always seem to get punished. Everyone else champions them. So all the general public and you here today might think, oh my God, that's great being a whistleblower. But actually your organisations very rarely do. And I'd look at the language around that as well. And freedom to speak is absolutely vital because it makes health and safety in organisations much better and much safer. And ultimately the children will always be better protected. One of the catchphrases that uh, one of the catchphrases that I, I seem to hear at conferences like this this year has been resilience. That seems to be a bit like Trump and his fake news. That's the word of the year. It feels like conferences like this. Resilience is the word of the year. So I want you to ask yourselves: How resilient are you? How resilient? How well do you look after yourself? Because that's that old adage of. When you're on a plane and the oxygen mask comes down, you have to look after yourself before you can look after a child. Sort yourselves out and look after yourself. And actually, if you need a day off, tell them I said you could, you'll be fine. <laughs> if it isn't written down, then it didn't happen. And an old paperwork is the most boring thing, and there's never any time, and it tends to be the thing that you put off till the very end. But if you didn't write it down, then it didn't happen. And the cases that we're taking to court next year happened in 2004, 2005, and we will provide corroborative evidence that meant the child who told us at the time they were being raped and abused is going to have a successful court case. So writing stuff down has to be your number one, pri has to be your number one priority. I also, because um, Karen said to me before, oh, we don't have this question, we don't ask people to ask questions, I kind of thought I'd anticipate some of the questions that you might want to know from me. Um, so I've already told you that, yes, I see the young people still, some of the young people. Um, some of the other young people have very chaotic lives. I don't see them. Uh, one or two are in prison. Um, but the ones that I do see are okay. Um, uh, what's for the future 
So in terms of the future, I kind of think um, we need to look at um, the legislation that um, surrounds online abuse. So there's a real conflict of interest, I think, lots of areas have suddenly commissioned services for low threshold mental health services, which is an act, you access that online. So teenagers on the one hand are being told, this is where you go for your mental health support. But then again, on the other hand, this is the thing that parents need to be wary of because there are perpetrators. I'm not saying the people in the low threshold mental health services are the perpetrators, but ultimately, that's a real conflict for me. We're purchasing stuff on the one hand, but actually telling parents to protect children on the other hand. In, in the UK, I don't know whether you have it in Scotland, there's, there's a, 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 a white paper about being homeschooled. Uh, that's likely to come about very soon. That'll be interesting for us all to be engaged in. How do we make sure that we reach out to children who are being home educated? That's an interesting as uh, aspect for the future. I think um, we also could be gender neutral in some of our language uh, around young people and young people's sexual activity. So we often talk about girls being promiscuous. We rarely talk about promiscuity. Well, I mean, promiscuity is a value judgment anyway, because it just tends to mean one more than I think is too many. And you might think, sorry, not you, but you know what I mean. <laughs> seven in a year is a lot. You might think, well, seven in a week, that's quite a lot. That's I mean, I might think seven in seven minutes is a bit much. Um, but promiscuity is a value judgment. We tend to only ever use that about girls and gay men. I think we also talk about low self-esteem and young women in relation to their sexual health. She's got low self-esteem, that's why she wants to have sex with lots of people. She's got low self-esteem, that's why she wants to have a baby. All of that stuff is, we have potential to be gen gender neutral around young people's sexual health. I thought you also might want to ask me questions about Maxine Peake. Well, she is too cool for school and she wears orange lipstick. And she came to my house and met my mum and uh, my mum just grasped me up for everything I'd ever done wrong. <laughs> that time when I got caught smoking when we were on holiday. Uh, the other time when I was really cheeky to that woman in the shop. Uh, she didn't want Maxine Peake to think that I was any kind of angel. Uh, I did take my bra off in Maxine Peake's house on New Year's Eve. Not kind of like, woohoo, uh, but because I felt very comfortable in Ma with Maxine Peake. Um, my hair was straight before all this started. No, I wasn't. Uh, it's been an incredible, incredibly stressful time. Fred is only small, by the way. So those of you who knew I was on, Fre on first dates, Fred is really tiny. He wears too much makeup, um, and he's an actor. So for all those people who are totally disillusioned, for all those people who don't know what I'm talking about, I'm really sorry I drifted <laughs> into something else. Uh, but Fred is really wee. Um, I, I am actually going to, I'm going to shut up. Um, I, I do honestly, really want to say thanks so much for inviting me. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure this afternoon to spend time with people and to mingle and loiter uh, with intent. Um, it is very much uh, um, an important part of... Um, I'll share because it's safe of me getting back to being the person that I think I was before all of this. Um, and I'd just like to big up all the survivors in the room and say, well done. You're in a room full of other people and you got up out of bed. Well played. Good for you. OK, thanks ever so much.